Hello everyone, welcome to The Scientist Explained. My name is Su Guali from Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology. And today I'm glad to share you a story of how a white tobacco battles with an insect, uh, a stem barrier. So as we all know that the plants are very important, just as a reminder that the plants produce the oxygen for the, all the living organisms, and uh, they, pro they provide us the food like wheat, rice, and uh, uh, potatoes or vegetables that we eat every day. And they, some of the plants also uh, are the sources for the medicines. For example, when I get a cold, uh, the medicine that I took often are the plant extracts. And then the plants can provide the fuel and the materials and of course, the plants provide, a, uh, provide us a lot of pleasures. So, then what the plant I am, am I working on? Is it a wild plant tobacco called Nicotiana attenuata? So, these plants, they grow widely in the desert in Utah, in the United States. Even though they are living in the desert, they have to face to a lot of enemies including some herbivores. And these are some pictures that we've taken in the nature that these uh, tobacco plants are getting attacked by the native herbivores. For example, like the pictures showing here that the caterpillar that who likes to eat the leaves and the flowers of this plant, and within a couple of days, it can easily eat up the whole plant. And then some insects, they suck the sap from the plants. And some larvae, they dig into the stem and feed inside the stem all the time. And some bugs, they like to eat the, feed, eat the seeds, the capsules of the plant. So all these herbivores actually cause huge damages on the plant, which affect the plant's fitness and also their production. And, but even though the plants cannot move away from these animals, they have produced their own strategy to defend themselves against these herbivores. So for example, when a, herbiv when a caterpillar uh, bites the plant, then the plant will immediately trigger a signal and knows that, ouch, I got attacked. And then it will start to produce some chemical compounds, which we call it defensive metabolites. And these compounds, some works as de direct defense, which means these compounds are toxic, like the nicotine and the glucosinolase in some brassic cells. And these compounds, uh, after the caterpillar eats them, they feel sick and they, they are not willing to eat this plant anymore. And some parts of the compounds, they work as direct uh, in defense. This is kind of like a signal that the, that the plants produce asking, crying for the help from others. For example, they produce the volatile organic compounds which are volatiles just like a perfume. And then when the plant gets attacked, they emit these chemicals volatiles, and then the neighboring plants can sense it and know that, all right, our enemy is here now. And also it will attract some uh, paradotes like some insects who hunt for these caterpillars, and then the problems are solved. And so let's go back to the first very beginning uh, of this process that after the plant gets attacked, how, what kind of the signals uh, it produces to start to produce the chemical compounds. And scientists found that plant hormones are actually play an essential role here. The, a, a kind of plant hormone called jasmonic acid the levels of this kind of hormones are getting much higher when they are attacked by the herbivores. And then this hormone will trigger the transduction of the signal and then the plants start to produce all these defensive compounds. So talking about the plant hormones, then what are they? The hormones actually is not something unique for the plants. 
And for example, that in our body, we have many kinds of hormones as well. For example, dopamine, which is a happy hormone that we makes us feel happy and exciting just with a little, among, a little amount of it. And in plants, they have a series of plant hormones as well. And this includes like auxin and gibberellin and jasmonate. And with just a little amount of these small molecules, they play very important roles on the plant's development and also the plant defense. Just like the one that I mentioned previously, jasmonase, and with uh, just a little amount of the jasmonase accumulation, they help the plants to defense against the enemies, the herbivores. So the plant hormone I am studying on is called strigolactins. Strigolactins are produced in the root and the identification of these chemicals actually can track back to 1960s. The scientists extracted these small molecules in the roots of the cotton and, and these are a, com a relatively complex compounds like what I'm showing here. Uh, the chemical called strigolactin and the chemical called orobanco, and they both belong to the plant hormone strigolactin family. And um, the scientists, after they extract the, the strigolactins, the, this chemicals in the roots, they found that it can trigger the seed germination of a parasitic plant called striga. And that's why they named these um, chemicals as strigolactins. And not so many years ago, the scientists realized that these uh, chemicals are actually a plant hormone, which are very important for the plant development. However, whether this plant hormone is also very important for the plants to defend against the herbivores or not is an unknown question. So, and then this is the question that I want to answer. Then how? Uh, the first thing that I want to do is to block the strigolactin signalings in the plants. And then uh, first I'd like to remind you the central dogma in all living organisms. Uh, in the cells, the information of DNA can be transferred to RNA by the transcription. And then the RNA will translate it to the protein, and which is the guy who really functions in the cells and make everything happen. And what we want to do is to block the process from the DNA to RNA, this transcription process. The genes that I choose are two, criti two critical genes that in uh, strigolactin signaling, which is MAX2 and CCD7. So after we uh, block the, the, this and transcription of these two genes in our plants with some genetic tools. And we indeed, we got the phenotype that we expected to see in the MAX2 plants and the CCD plants that uh, I'm showing here. As you can see that the MAX2 and the CCD7 plants are shorter and they have much more branches compared to the control plant. That's the one that I didn't uh, block any transcription in it. And we further checked the RNA levels in these plants. As you can see that in the MAX2 plants, the RNA levels of MAX2 gene are relatively lower compared to the control plants. And then the RNA levels of CCD7 gene in CCD7 plus plants are lower as well. So because we saw these so different branching phenotypes, the herbivore that we want to use is an uh, insect which actually eats inside the stem of the plants. And then this is a native enemy of the tobacco in the desert. And in March and April, the adult plant will lay the eggs on the plant and then uh, after they hatched, the larvae will fit inside the pin, inside the stem, eat up the horse, the piece part, before they transfer to the pupa. And oh, sorry. Go back. 
and then afterwards the adults may well break out from the plant from the window that they made previously on the plant and then the, their new life cycle starts again. So what we want to do is want to, uh, to see if this larvae will fit on our plants and if they like it more or not. However, we couldn't wait the, the bugs to do the job for us because normally we will use like a hundred of plants at the same time and then the bugs will not lay eggs one by one at the same time for us. So we have to do this job by ourselves. What we do is we collect the eggs from, all the, from, the, from the vivos and then we inoculate them on plants by ourselves. And then we just uh, uh, make a cut and then put the egg inside and wait two and three weeks later then the, the larvae will dig inside into the stem and will feed inside the piece of the plant. So then uh, after three weeks, we split the uh, stems and then take out the larvae with a forcep. And the results we got are fascinating. As you can see here from the picture, that the larvae that feed inside the MAX2 plants and the MAX CCT7 plants are growing bigger compared to the ones that are feeding inside the control plants. And we further weighed how heavy the larvae are. And you can see in the chart that the uh, biomass of the larvae that feed in the MAX2 and the CCD7 plants are heavier compared to the control plants. So then how the plants take advantage, take use of these uh, hormones to defend against themselves that I mentioned previously, the plants will produce some defensive compounds and use that at the direct defense, which are toxic to the caterpillars. And then we analyzed the defensive compounds in, the, in our plants, and we found that the nicotine is actually changed in our plants. And as we all know that nicotine is a toxic compound and is also because it's also toxic for us, and that's why smoking is unhealthy. And then when we check the levels of nicotine in our plants, we found that in MAX2 and CCD7 plants, the nicotine levels are much lower. But we're not sure, is it really that the nicotine is the reason for the worst defense of our MAX2 and CCD7 plants? So what we want to do is, if we can manipulate the biosynthesis of the nicotine in, in plants, then we will know. So uh, it is already known that the nicotine biosynthesis is from the uh, biosynthesis from the putrescine and the nicotinic acid through uh, some, some of the enzymes and one of it is called PMT. So when we block the PMT gene, the, the biosynthesis of the nicotine will be blocked and then we will get lower nicotine in these plants. And then indeed, when we block this PMT gene, we found that in these plants, the, we, almost can, we almost cannot detect the nicotine levels in these plants. And when we further feed these plants with our larvae, we found that the larvae are growing happier and grow bigger in the plants without nicotine compared to the control plants. So in the end, I'd like to sum up all, this, all, the, all the results I mentioned. So first, the plants use hormones to battle against the destructive insects. And then second, when blocking strigolactins, it will lead to lower nicotine levels in the plant stems. And third, the insects feeding inside the stems are, grow, are growing bigger in plants with lower nicotine. That means the plant produces the strigolactins in the roots to, def to help them to defend against the enemies, the herbivores. And the herbivores actually uh, can cause very huge problems, just like the, desert, uh, the outbreak of the desert lotus that happens in the last year and this year in Africa and some parts of the Asia. 
and it really causes a huge reduction of the food production. So if we understand better how the plants defend themselves against the herbivores, and then we can use some new strategies in agriculture to help them to defend the herbivores better and then to produce more food in our future. And that's all. Thank you for your watching. So larvae that eat nicotine stay smaller, but humans that smoke nicotine when they're young or teenagers, they also grow not as tall. Do you think that's the same mechanism? Uh, I'm not sure about this, but I think uh, the, to the toxicity of the nicotine on the larvae will have more uh, effect on it as the plant is specifically produced to defend against these herbivores. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay.